Well, happy Sunday, Riff family. My name is Young. Uh, I have the joy and privilege of being the MSU venue director. Uh, I've also stepped in as the interim venue director at our Rio Town venue as Pastor Justin. Uh, if you didn't hear last week, it has stepped into his sabbatical. So I'll be stepping in as the interim director uh, at Riv's Rio Town venue. So shout out to my Rio Town family. Uh, hopefully I can see you guys along with everybody else uh, sometime in the near future. Um, you know, for today's service, I want to start us off with something a little bit different than what we've been doing. Um, you know, if you recall when we used to meet live, it, was, it seems so long ago, um, where we would sometimes say hi to our neighbors, say hi to those uh, that are sitting next to us or around us. Uh, I want to encourage us to do a digital wave to your neighbor. And this is what we're going to do. All right. I want to encourage you to take a picture of the spot that you are watching this service at. And if you're on Instagram, share the picture that story and tag a friend and if you want tag at Riv Church so we can see where you're tuning this in, uh, into the service from um, or if you don't have Instagram no worries uh, if you're watching this from Facebook comment uh, in the comment section below tag a friend and say hi to them it's just a way for us to get uh, a little bit more interactive with those that are part of our church family uh, while we're tuning in uh, through an online service. So I want to encourage you to do that today. Um, and I also want to encourage you uh, for our message today as Pastor Noel takes us through uh, more First Peter to go ahead and grab your Bibles and to follow uh, along uh, while reading the actual word uh, there. Um, you can also follow along this in this message on rivchurch.com slash live. All right, I'm going to say that again, rivchurch.com slash live. Live. If you've not checked that site out, um, you're missing out. There's tons of ways that you can get connected there. Um, you can submit your prayer requests and have people pray for you. Again, I, like I said, you can follow along with the message. And there are a bunch of other resources there for you to get connected uh, with our church family at Riverview Church. Um, thanks again so much for tuning in with us this morning. I'm super excited to worship alongside you guys. Uh, the band that is going to be leading us in worshiping our God together uh, is the Royal We. They're a band from the Holt venue, and I'm super excited for them to lead us into worship. Thanks again. Spirit, you made me see. I swore I knew the way on my own. Head full 
on the rocks a heart made of stone but spirit you moved in me that your touch my sleeping spirit was awakened on my This next song that we're going to sing uh, is called Nothing But the Blood of Jesus, and it was written in, I believe, 1876 by Robert Lowry. Um, and while the instrumentation that we use today may be a little different than it was almost 150 years ago, the the message in the lyrics is, is just as true today as it was then, as it will be forevermore. Um, and it says, what can wash away our sin nothing but the blood of Jesus. So let's, uh, let's sing that together now. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus.
My name is Amy Hereford. My family and I go to Riverview's Westside venue and I serve on the Riv Kids team there. Today's scripture passage will be from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic. Love one another and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called for this, so that you may inherit a blessing. For the one who wants to love life and to see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit, and let him turn away from evil and do what is good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? The sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, so he brought me in, oh, his love for me, yes, his love. The sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child. a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me, whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I forsaken I am who you say I am you are for me not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen not forsaken I am who you say I am you are for me not against me
We're going to take a few minutes to pray together now as a church family. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why we come uh, come to God in prayer. Uh, right now, we want to focus on two of those, which is uh, giving thanks and bringing requests before him. So um, I have a couple just prompts, a couple topics that I'm going to bring up. Um, and then wherever you are, whomever you're with, uh, let's, just, let's just take this time to reflect and to, to bring these before God together as a church family. So the first thing that we want to want to lift up in prayer is just praise. Uh, thanks to God for his faithfulness, uh, for his constancy in our unpredictable and crazy season that we find ourselves in now. So let's pray together. Next, uh, we want to pray for peaceful and loving interactions uh, with those around us, specifically uh, those who might not hold the same uh, opinions or points of view that we do. Uh, we want to pray that we would reflect Christ to, to everyone we interact with. So let's, let's take this time to pray together for that now. And finally, let's take this time to pray for opportunities to bless those around us and to paint a picture of Christ, uh, his, his love and his grace in other people's lives. Uh, let's pray together now. Father, I thank you that we can come before you uh, today as a church family. Even if we're not all physically in the same place, God, uh, I thank you that we can, can come together in prayer like this. Lord, we thank you uh, that you still reign even when life is crazy. God, we thank you for your grace and for your love, and we pray this all in your precious name. Amen. I just want to say thanks for uh, tuning in despite uh, being in this weird time and doing church online like this. I really appreciate the time that you've carved out to do church with us through this digital avenue. Um, you know, if you're a lot like me, maybe you have also gone through a difficult time uh, during this season. Uh, maybe you kind of felt like your mental, emotional, and spiritual health kind of dwindle here and there. Um, if you are going through a difficult time, maybe you, you uh, got furloughed from a job, maybe you lost a job, uh, maybe you uh, are working from home and now unexpectedly uh, are homeschooling your kids. Uh, maybe you know someone who's sick. Uh, maybe you know someone who's passed away during the season. Uh, whatever it might be, if you are going through grief, if you're going through a stressful time, if you're going through just a, a, a difficult time of suffering during the season, um, I want to encourage you to check out a ministry that we have at Riverview uh, called Stephen Ministry. Uh, these are not pastors or counselors, but they are actually people from within in our church uh, who are highly equipped and trained and skilled to serve those um, within our church. <laughs> and this is how the church builds one another up, that while we go through pain and suffering, there are other people within our church that will come alongside you as you're going through that and share the burden that you're feeling um, by giving you a listening ear, a compassionate heart, uh, and even providing different perspectives on your suffering and the stressful season that you might be going through. Um, so uh, I, I want to encourage you to check out our Stephen ministers uh, and our Stephen ministry uh, because they, 
these folks, they do this so well with the utmost care and the love and compassion that is needed to, to walk alongside uh, seasons of grief and suffering that we might be going through. So uh, if that's you, if you're going through a hard time, uh, you can get connected to a Stephen Minister at rivchurch.com slash live. Um, and if you're looking to get connected to uh, other parts of our church, again, you can go to that link, rivchurch.com slash live and get connected uh, to the Riv family. Um, I just also want to say thank you so much for those that are continuing to give uh, to Riv. Thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, your giving actually impacts directly to our church plants that we have partnered up with uh, as they too are being affected by um, you know, the current uh, situation, the current pandemic that we're in. So can, thank you so much for your continued generosity. Um, if you consider Riv uh, as your church home, uh, I want to encourage you to, to give. Uh, and you can do that at rivchurch.com slash give. Or you can text the number on the screen and set up uh, your account uh, to uh, give directly through that as well. Uh, thanks so much again for tuning in. Thanks again for your generosity. And uh, I look forward to hearing uh, the message from Pastor Noel and hope that it blesses you today. The book of 1 Peter was written by the Apostle Peter sometime between 60 and 65 AD. It is addressed to believers scattered all across the continent who were facing intense persecution. While suffering is certain to continue, we can find hope in our true position, seated with Christ in glory. Hey everybody, my name is Noel. I'm one of the pastors here at Riverview, and Young, who was hosting the service, mentioned way at the beginning uh, that this would be a good week for you to have your Bibles handy. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to grab your Bible yet, and if you own a Bible, uh, I'll let you run and go get it while I take a few sips of coffee. Um, because hopefully you have it in front of you or whatever Bible you use. If you use an app or anything, it'd be good to pull that up now. So I'll give you another minute. All right, you got your Bible? Now, so here is why I thought it would be great um, for you to have your own Bible handy today. Um, sometimes, um, oftentimes really, uh, when I am doing sermon preparation, when I'm writing these teachings, I end up going down a, a bit of a rabbit hole. In fact, it's, it's one of the most fun parts of writing a sermon um, is that I personally learn a lot because one of my first steps I take um, is I read the passage over and over, and then once I've read it over and over made a bunch of notes, then I start to wander uh, wherever that message might take me through the Bible. And most of the uh, time, a kind of a crazy percentage of what I learn and what I read and I, what I wish I could put into a message, I can't. Um, and so that's a lot. I get a lot of emails. Why didn't you talk about this? Why didn't you talk about this? I got a limited amount of time and I can't always get to all of it. Um, but it is great for me personally. And I learn a ton. It's really challenging, you know, enlightening, stuff like that um, as I am uh, studying. And so today... Uh, what I would thought I would do is I would take you on a journey through the rabbit hole with me, that we could jump down the rabbit hole uh, together. So what I want to do is I want to show you part of the journey that I went on in my study for today's message. And once we hit the bottom of the rabbit hole, um, we will climb back out of the rabbit hole um, back to the passage at hand. And if that uh, metaphor is too abstract for you. Don't worry, just follow along. Uh, it'll be easy for you. As always, um, if you don't have a Bible or you don't want to use your Bible, uh, there will be verses on the screen. Um, and you can always go to rivchurch.com slash live if you want to follow along on that platform as well. So this week, um, where we find ourselves in our series on 1 Peter um, is in chapter 3. And I, I know we already had the passage read, but I'm going to start by reading a couple of these verses again. Um, and so if you have your Bible with you, you can kind of read along with me. Um, we're starting today in chapter 3, and I'm just going to read verses 8 through the little bit of verse 10. Now, here it is. He says, Finally, all of you, be like-minded and sympathetic, love one another, and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing, since you are called for this, so that you may inherit a blessing. For, now, if you're following along in your own Bible, you are probably, depending on the layout of the, of the particular Bible you have, you're seeing that right after that word for in verse 10, it jumps to a quote. 
Um, and so this is the first step down the rabbit hole for me, because I asked myself the question, where did this quote come from? And if you have a reference Bible or uh, you have footnotes uh, in your app or anything like that, you may see that this quote uh, that he's about to quote comes from Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. And so let's do this. Let's go back to Psalm uh, 34. It should be right in the middle of your Bible. Uh, Psalm 34 is kind of in the middle-ish right there. And we'll look at Psalm 34. So what's interesting here is if you kind of scroll up a couple verses from verse 12 in chapter 34, you're going to see verse 8. And verse 8 says this, taste and see that the Lord is good. So like when I'm reading this chapter, kind of looking at the context, I was like, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. And it should sound familiar because back in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, um, Peter quoted this already. So he has already quoted from Psalm 34. So now he's got a couple quotes in this small little letter that are coming from the same psalm. And I think that it implies something really, really interesting about the Apostle Peter. Uh, The Apostle Peter, obviously guided by the Holy Spirit, um, was... I think it seems here that he was reading or studying or or meditating on the psalm um, as he was writing this letter to these Christians that were scattered all over the Roman Empire. It's probably why he keeps quoting it, because it's on the top of his mind. And and by the way, that happens to all of us, doesn't it? Like for me, um, whatever media I'm consuming, uh, be it the Bible or a book or Twitter or a show I'm binging on, on Netflix, Um, it'll pop to mind in conversations just quite naturally. Um, It it probably happens to you too. It's it's why so many people can just drop a quote from The Office into any old conversation because they've watched The Office over and over and over and over again, right? Um, It's kind of like, in a sense, my my coffee cup here. Um, Whatever I fill my coffee cup with, uh, and you don't have any idea what's in my cup, you might assume that it's coffee, but it might not be coffee. But whatever I fill this cup with, If I get jostled, it's the stuff that's going to kind of fall out. Um, And and, and the obvious application for me is um, that that's one of many good reasons to spend time regularly in our Bible um, because it's the thing that will get jostled out of us. So whatever media we're consuming uh, jostles out. So let's go back to Peter. I wonder if while he was writing this letter of encouragement to scattered, persecuted Christians all over the Roman Empire— I wonder why he kept going back to this psalm. Why would he go to Psalm 34 so often? What was it that was causing him? Why was this on the top of his mind? Now, we don't know. I'm going to be really clear about this. We don't know um, because the Bible doesn't tell us. And so anything related to why he was reading this psalm is conjecture, but it was floating in the back of my mind as I was studying. Um, And so as I'm reading Psalm 34, I roll up to the top of Psalm 34, and there's a little header. This is what that header says. Um, If you're using the uh, CSB translation, which I'm using, it'll say this. It says, concerning David, when he pretended to be insane in the presence of Abimelech, who drove him out and he departed. Now, now, if you have the ESV or the the net, instead of saying uh, concerning, it says written by. And essentially what this is saying is something really interesting. The book of Psalms is like a hymnal. And some of you guys may know, not know what a hymnal is. You may have never seen one of those. A hymnal is a book of songs. Uh, lots of churches used them before there was projectors, right? And so King David wrote um, 73 of the 150 psalms in, in the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is a hymnal. So there's 150 songs. 73 of those songs were written by King David. And what King David often did is he did what most creative artists do. He wrote from his own experience. Um, The difference between King David and, you know, Billie Eilish is, is he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he was writing these songs that would turn around and become part of the worship services um, for Israel. So all of Israel would sing these songs that were based on King David's life. I mean, imagine for a moment taking the most traumatic events in your life, um, including a lot of your own personal failures, and writing them into a song, and then giving them what to one of the Riverview bands, and then all of us sing a song about the failures in your life. It's absolutely wild. So King David wrote this song in Psalm 34 um, based on a crazy event that happened to his life. 
So to get to this event, we have to go deeper into our rabbit hole. Now, from here, from Psalms, we flip back to 1 Samuel, which is about a quarter of the way through your Bible. And, and here's the context of 1 Samuel uh, chapter 21. In chapter 21, a guy named Saul is the king of Israel. And, and God sends uh, a prophet by the name of Samuel to anoint David, who was just this young shepherd boy at the time, uh, David as king. So even though Saul was technically king, um, David was anointed by God as king. And so in a sense, this was a time in history where there were two kings. Uh, Saul was the king in the eyes of all of the people, the whole world, and David was actually king in God's sight, um, even though he wasn't king here on earth. Does that make sense? <laughs> so David um, even becomes a, a bit of a war hero. He kills the Philistine Goliath. You've probably heard the David and Goliath story. And he chopped off his head with the giant's own sword. And all of this, what it did is it served to increase David's popularity with the people, and that, along with David's anointing by God uh, through uh, uh, the prophet as king, it all enraged Saul. Um, and then, to, to make matters worse, Saul's son, Jonathan, becomes David's best friend. So this makes Saul even more livid, right? So Saul decides that he's going to kill David. And he tries to kill David. But Jonathan, his son, warns David that his dad was going to try to kill him. So David hides in a field. And then Saul blows up Jonathan for helping David and throws a spear at his own son, throws a spear at his son. And so Jonathan rushes out of there. He warns David. Um, and David then goes on the run uh, from Saul. Um, he ends up in a place called Nob, uh, N-O-B, and, and he meets up with a priest by the name of Ah uh, 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 Ahimelech. My brain just completely farted on that word. Um, and Ahimelech gives him some holy bread to eat. It's a, it's a whole long story. You can read about it in 1 Samuel. And then he gives David Goliath's sword, the one that David had used to cut Goliath's head off, um, and a, a spy saw all of this happen, and the spy ran back to tell Saul that David um, was there, so David uh, heads to a place called Gath to hide out, but Gath is, wait for it, Goliath's hometown. <laughs> So now David goes to Goliath's hometown with Goliath's sword that he used to kill Goliath, and when he gets there, he's recognized. And so that's the context of 1 Samuel 21. So now let me read what happens next in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 10. It says this, David fled that day from Saul's presence and went to King Ashish of Gath. But Achish, or Achish probably, uh, his servant said to him, isn't this David the king of the land? Did you notice what he called him? The king of the land? He didn't call Saul the king, right? His servants are like, wait, this is the king, right? Uh, the king of the land. Don't they sing about him during their dances? Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Do you see the increase of popularity that David had? Um, David took this to heart and became very afraid of King Achish of Gath. Um, because why? Well, probably for a lot of reasons, including the fact that he had beheaded Goliath, right? And so, um, and he's in, in Goliath's hometown. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. He acted like a madman around them, scribbling on the doors of the city gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Look, you can see the man is crazy, Akish said to his servants. Why did you bring him to me? Do I have such a shortage of crazy people that you have brought this one to act crazy around me? Is this one going to come into my house? <laughs> in other words, he says, you, you aren't going to let this crazy person into my house, are you? And this is uh, the bottom of our rabbit hole. And, and you can probably see how sometimes, it, like, I'll start a sermon and I don't even know where... It's going, and I just hope that I find a sermon along the way, right? And so this is uh, where my brain went. Um, we can't know this for sure, but as I read this, I couldn't help but wonder if Peter had wandered down the same rabbit hole that we just went down. You see, Peter was writing this letter, 1 Peter, to, uh, to Christians who were on the run, just like David was. 
They were anointed as royalty, like David. He called them what? A royal priesthood in chapter 2, right after he quoted Psalm 34 the first time. And yet, they were also strangers and exiles, like David. They had people out to kill them, like David. And I wonder if Peter found himself studying the Old Testament with an eye to encouraging these Christians, and that's how he ended up on Psalm 34, that he was quoting for them. This psalm that David wrote um, when his earthly reality finally synced up to what God had already said about him, when he became king, a time when he had gained enough perspective that he could look back on this crazy story of when he tried to pretend like he was insane so that the king would uh, leave him alone. And, 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 and if he looked at that situation and he wrote this psalm to encourage Israel. So let's walk back up the rabbit hole now by reading David's words that he wrote in the psalm to encourage Israel based on that crazy situation. This is what he said, Psalm 34, chapter, uh, chapter 34, verses 12 through 16. Who is someone who desires life, loving a long life to enjoy what is good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn away from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil to remove all memory of them from the earth. So, What does that have to do with David running for his life from Saul? What does this have to do with the Roman Christians running for their life from the emperor Nero who was trying to have them killed? Well, everything. In his song, what is David singing about? He's singing about wanting a long life. He wants a long, good life. He wants a long, enjoyable life. And yet he was running for his life. And just like the Roman Christians, who had been falsely blamed for doing evil by the emperor, were on a run for their life when they just wanted to live their lives. And even though David was under the wrath of the king, he was comforted, looking back, by appealing to a higher authority than the king. He set his eyes on a God that has his face set against those, what does he say, who do evil. Not those who are blamed for evil like the Romans, uh, Roman Christians were, but those who actually do evil. Eyes that see the righteous, ears that hear when they call for help. Let me just say this. Throughout the Bible, from cover to cover, what you will see is this truth about God's character. His eyes always see the righteous when they suffer. His ears always hear when they call out for help. His face is always set against those who do evil. You know, you know, so many people naively say that Christianity doesn't have an answer for evil. They say, well, if God is so good, why does evil exist? If, if God is so powerful, why doesn't he do something about all that evil? And why is there still suffering in this world and pain in this world? Like many of you, I was enraged and heartbroken, and I, and I had all kinds of other emotions that I, I don't have words for. Um, when this last week I watched the video of the killing of, of George Floyd in, in Minneapolis, and there was a sense in which I almost even felt like paralyzed. Uh, because it just seems like it's another in a string of videos like it that we've seen over the years. Uh, and, and in fact, it's not even the first uh, this month, right, for, for that matter. There have just been so many. And, and, and someone on Twitter made the comment that the only reason why it seems like there are so many videos like this right now is because everyone's carrying a phone around with them. And before the age of smartphones, um, where they could record all this stuff, no one would have seen tragedies like this. And I was reflecting on that, and I thought, it's kind of partially true, but it's not fundamentally true. 
because we wouldn't have seen tragedies like this. Almost certainly we wouldn't have, but someone would. God's eyes always see those who are suffering. God's ears always hear when the downtrodden call out for help. His face is always set against those who do evil. And the thing is, Christianity is the only religious system out there, the only faith out there that has a true solution to the problem of evil. That solution has a name, and the name is Jesus. God's face is, is, it was actually turned away from Jesus in his final moments of suffering on the cross so that he could turn his face toward us to save us. Even a cursory reading of the Bible declares loud and clear that God always calls out to those who are suffering so he can be their refuge. And he calls on those that he rescues to then themselves become rescuers in his name. And this is what King David does. He writes a song replaying his own pain so that others um, who are suffering can lift their eyes up from their suffering to the place where their help comes from. And here's David's application. He's saying, because God sees, um, because God hears, because God has his his face set against those who do evil, verse 13 in Psalm 34, He says, keep your tongue from evil, your lips from deceitful speech, turn away from evil, and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. Do you hear what he's saying? This world will do evil. This world will lie, not you. Turn from evil. Do what is good. Seek peace. Pursue peace. Run after peace. This is David's call. And then Peter, another in a long line of guys who God saved, took David's words from Psalm 34 to heart, and he writes a letter now to these Roman Christians who are scattered and persecuted in in the Roman Empire, and he gives David's words to them as a gift and as a guide. So let's climb back up the rabbit hole to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. He says this, finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic, love one another and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called for this so that you may inherit a blessing. What Peter was saying to them, I would say to you, You were called for this moment. It was true for King David. It is true for Peter. It was true for the original readers of this letter. And it is true for us. This is our calling in the moment that we are living in now. Knowing that God's eyes always see the suffering in this world, that his ears are always, um, he always hears the downtrodden call for help. Because his face is always set against those who do evil, Peter says we can understand that God wants to give us a blessing, a blessing to his people, the ones who have been made righteous because of the suffering of his son Jesus, and, and, and we can apply this in our suffering. So how do we live knowing all this is true? Well, he gives us a path. What does he say? He says, be like-minded. And, and being like-minded doesn't mean that we're all clones, that we all think exactly alike about all things or culturally you know, monolithic. It means that we are united, that we, as Jesus' church, are people who are united uh, behind the banner of our king, King Jesus. Uh, We care about what he cares about. We we remember that even though we are scattered, we are still one people who are like-minded. He says, be sympathetic. That means our hearts break for the things that God's heart breaks for. That means when there's suffering in this world, we don't hide from that suffering. We look at it. We engage with it. And when there is evil, we face it and we call evil, evil. That's part of being sympathetic. 
he says, love one another. So, so many people don't understand what it means to love. Our culture, our culture has almost kind of like squished the balloon of, of love um, and squished the power out of the word. Um, and if you want a good definition of love, just go later on today, read 1 Corinthians 13. Um, we often think of 1 Corinthians 13 as a wedding passage, because, but it, it's, it's so much more than a wedding passage. In 1 Corinthians 13, it gives us the definition of love. It calls us to love like God loves, because as 1 John says, God is himself the definition of love. And so when it says in 1 Corinthians 13 um, that we are to be patient and kind and, and not to envy and not to, to boast and not to be arrogant or rude, when it sell, says we're not to be self-seeking or irritable, when it says we're not to keep a record of wrongs, it is calling us to this kind of love. When it says in 1 Corinthians 13 that love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but it rejoices in the truth it, that it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. It gives us the complexity of love. Love speaks the truth, but it believes the best. It hopes all things, and it's patient and kind and not boastful and not enviable. What does he say in 1 Peter? He says, be compassionate. That word literally means your gut, your bowels, in fact, is the word, <laughs> are moved toward those in pain. You're humble. He says, be humble. Be compassionate and humble, not thinking too highly of yourself. And then, what does he say? Not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing. Does that sound familiar? Well, it should. It's in this letter already. It's what our big brother, King Jesus, did. It is, it is not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult. We are people who bless those who persecute us. Now, notice something really important in all of this, all of this roadmap. It is such a flip from how we normally think. When we suffer, um, when we are insulted, when someone treats us with evil, we give a blessing in return. We are more concerned with the person that is insulting us than ourselves. And when someone else is suffering, we are sympathetic and compassionate toward their pain. What, what Peter is doing here is he is calling us to a life that is flipped inside out because of the gospel of Jesus, that we become more concerned with other people's pain than our own pain. In fact, we're more concerned with the pain of the person who's persecuting us than our own pain. Other people's suffering is more important to us than our own. And in that way, we follow our Lord Jesus. This was David's encouragement to the people of Israel. It was Peter's encouragement to the scattered Christians in Rome. And it's my encouragement to you. When you have pain, look to Jesus for comfort. When others have pain, step into it and point those people to Jesus for comfort. Peter closes this section with these words in chapter 3, verse 13. He says, Who then will harm you if you are devoted to do what is good? Well, wait a minute. A lot of people. And he's writing to people who are being harmed when they're devoted to doing what is good. So, so what is he saying? He's saying, No one who matters eternally will harm you for doing good. They can't harm you in a way that affects the inheritance that you have been given because of the person and work of Jesus. In fact, he's not even done with this thought. Um, but uh, we're out of time. <laughs> so if you are following along with your Bible, you can keep reading to see where he goes. Everyone else, well, you're just going to have to wait uh, for next week. So let's take a minute and, and pray this. In fact, I want to pray um, that this would be who we are. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you um, that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, that his ears are open to our prayer, to the righteousness prayer. We thank you that the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so we just pray that in response, we would be like-minded, sympathetic, loving, compassionate, humble, not paying back evil for evil, not paying back insult for insult, but blessing those who persecute us. And we just pray that this would be our calling, that we would know this to be our calling so that we may inherit a blessing and so that more people would come to faith in Jesus. 
We pray all this in his victorious, suffering name. Amen. The Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Lord, now indeed I find and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. It's Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Yeah. 
sun can bid me then depart. Tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end of all my sin Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just is satisfied To look on him in pardon Perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace, the King of glory and of grace, the King of glory and of grace, the King of glory. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Um, I just want to read the first verse that Noel went over today. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Uh, Peter says this. He says, Finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic. Love one another and be compassionate and humble. Those are such rich words. So easy to say <laughs> and yet so hard to do. Um, but I want to encourage you to run to that challenge and to, to try to live that out in your life, whether that's today or the rest of the week. Uh, maybe you can memorize this or write it somewhere to just be a fresh reminder to you each and every single day. Um, so I just want to encourage you to do that. Thanks so much again for uh, tuning into our service. We'll be here same time, same place uh, next Sunday, 10 a.m. You can tune in at rivchurch.com stream uh, and have a good Sunday. Peace.